I'm Mark Golub, and the Israeli elections are in the book, and so we're going to take this hour to talk about the elections and to get some reaction in what everyone is calling a dramatic, come-from-behind, surprise victory as Benjamin Netanyahu has emerged the clear winner in this year's elections. When we were with you yesterday, we were reporting the race was neck and neck between Mr. Netanyahu and Isaac Bougie Herzog, head of what was once called the Labor Party, but which is now called the Zionist Union. Both Likud and Zionist Union seem to have won around 27 seats. One channel in Israel, Channel 2, had exit polls showing Mr. Netanyahu with 28 seats and Mr. Herzog with 27. But today, with more than 99% of the votes tallied, it turns out that Likud won 30 seats, a significant increase of 12 seats over the 18 seats they held in the last election government. The last, the last number is the number in parentheses. They had won 18. They held 18 seats in the last government. Now they hold 30, or they looks like they will have 30. The Zionist Union won only 24 seats, 24 seats, which was also a gain for the Labor Group, which had 21 seats in the last government. So the results the day after the Israeli election now show Likud anticipating 30 seats, the Zionist Union 24. The United Arab Parties did very well, led by Eman Uda, 14 seats up three from the last government. Yair Lapid's Yesh Atid party came in fourth with 11 seats, down a whopping eight seats from its position in the last coalition government. Then there's Moshe Kahlon and his new Kulanu party came in fifth with 10 seats, and Kahlon is likely to be part of the next coalition government as finance minister. Naftali Bennett's Jewish Home Party fell to sixth spot, winning only eight seats down four from the last government. The Orthodox parties, Shas and United Torah Judaism, won seven and six seats respectively, Shas down four seats, while the third Orthodox party, Yachad, did not win 3.2% of the vote to qualify as a Knesset party, and Yachad is out altogether. Avigdor Lieberman may have been the biggest loser as his Yisrael Beitenu party won only six seats in this Knesset, losing more than half of its 13 seats that it had in the last government. And finally, the left-leaning Meretz wound up in last place with only four seats, down two seats from its position in the last government. So the top three, Likud, Zionist Union, and United Arab Parties, all gained but virtually every other party lost seats, which means there's been a, di a redistribution of seats, especially from Jewish Home and Yisrael Beitenu to right-leaning parties, which seem to have passed their seats on to Likud. So it's not clear that this government as a whole will be more right-wing than the prior government. And those who are saying so in the American media may not really understand the Israeli political landscape. It simply, the results simply may mean that Likud has concentrated more of those on the right than they had in the prior government after the prior election. So all those who counted Benjamin Netanyahu out and were ready to write his political obituary, they now have to eat a good deal of crow today. While in America... Jews who love Bibi are celebrating, and Jews who believe he has been a disaster for Israel, they are in mourning. You know, I saw Israeli journalist Ari Shavid of Haaretz interviewed on MSNBC's Morning Joe. Uh, Ari Shavit was interviewed by Mika Brzezinski, one of the co-hosts of Morning Joe. And what he said was, 
for the Israel I belong to, this is Ari Shavit, for the Israel I belong to, this is a very devastating morning. And then Ari Shavit went on to say that he was afraid that fear had won the day in Israel, that fear was the big time winner over hope. So what does the re-election of Benjamin Netanyahu really mean for the Israeli scene and for the U.S.-Israeli relationship? For some insight, we're pleased to have on our phones from Jerusalem once again the outstanding journalist for the Times of Israel, Chaviv Retigur. Chaviv, thank you again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Chaviv, by the way, so that our audience has a sense of where you're coming from, in general, how is the Times of Israel positioned and how are you positioned? Are you left, center, or right? Thank you for asking, because it gives me an opportunity to say uh, something important about that. Um, Israeli media generally is uh, very closely identified with the political side, and, and, and intentionally and consciously and explicitly. It's not, <clears throat> you know, I'm not accusing them of that. That's something that they're very proud of. Uh, that they're advocates for a particular vision of Israel. We are one of the very, very few, and certainly the largest of them, uh, that believes that there is a value in not making sides politically, that there's a lot to say that can only be said if you're not pro-Netanyahu, anti-Netanyahu, uh, if you're not pulling in either direction in an election. Obviously, that's an extremely difficult thing to do emotionally. Every single journalist Every single editor at the Times of Israel is an Israeli citizen. I can tell you that we have a much higher voter turnout inside the Times of Israel than in the general population. Um, but I hope that when you read the Times of Israel, uh, and when our uh, viewers read the Times of Israel, then they're not going to be able to identify a party line. We often criticize Netanyahu, and we often uh, try to explain and, in effect, defend uh, what Netanyahu is trying to do when we think the world is misunderstanding what he's trying to do, without justifying it. So um, I think of myself, and certainly the Times of Israel thinks of itself as not politically identified, and that, that is providing a service to the people of Israel. Well, good for you. Uh, I appreciate your being able to say that and to give our audience, again, a, a sense of where you and the Times of Israel fall because you know in America, it's very similar to what you describe in Israel. More and more media outlets seem to be identified with and advocates for either a left position or a right position. And I'm very sympathetic to the way you describe the Times of Israel. I believe that it's what we're trying to do here at JBS. I say all the time, the overarching agenda that I have and which the channel has is that we are pro-Jewish and pro-Israel, and within the pro-Jewish and pro-Israel perspective, there can be a multiplicity of views and ideas. And, and so I'm very, very pleased that our audience got to hear your explanation of who, who you are and how you position yourself in the Jewish and Israeli scene. So with that said, I have a couple of specific questions, and again, Haviv, here we are, American Jews and Americans in general in the United States. Most of us only get to see what the American media wants to show us of Israel in general, the Israeli election. And one of the things we've been trying to do on JBS is sort of cut through that and give viewers, Jewish and not Jewish, a much, more, a much larger and more objective view of what Israel is. But we've been told many things, and I want you, as an Israeli journalist who's on the ground, who's been covering this intimately, day after day, I want you to try to clarify what we have been told and where is the American news reporting accurate? Where is it, in some way, uh, a projection of its own desires and wishes and political agendas? So the first question is this. Chaviv, what was in fact the driving issue that was the underpinning of this entire election? Was it the economy and the cost of housing for young families and the disparate economic situation of the rich and poor in Israel? Or did it have to do with the global scene, 
the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Iranian nuclear threat and the Obama-Netanyahu relationship. If you had to, and I'm not saying it had to be either or, but one or the other was the driving force. And we've been told at one and the same time, Khabib, it was the domestic economy, but on American television, in American media, we're told it was all about the international scene. What's the truth, Khabib? Yeah, well, I, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to upset the apple cart. Um, the truth is that um, it wasn't an election about either of those things, because when it comes to what, how to fix some of the real deep crises in the Israeli economy, there's not a huge amount of difference between the sides. When Netanyahu wanted to appoint a government committee to, uh, to um, tackle the cost of living, the incredibly high cost of living, much higher than in the United States that Israelis have to grapple with, he appointed a man named Manuel Trachtenberg to run that committee in 2011 for his right-wing government. And then when Labor wanted to show that it was serious about tackling the cost of living in this election, it actually ran the same exact economist, Manuel Trachtenberg, uh, as their candidate for finance minister. So the sides on the economy share the same economist. When it comes to Iran, they are identical in their criticism of the Iran deal that's being developed with the P5 plus one countries and the White House. Uh, and when it comes to the Palestinians, uh, Isaac Herzog of Labor actually gave a speech in which he said, I'm not going to promise you all peace because I don't want to raise expectations that it might not be possible to meet. So there aren't substantive differences on those issues between the sides. However, the election did deal with those issues in the sense that it was actually an election about trust. <laughs> People like uh, Moshe Kachlon of the Kulanu Party were running an economic platform that criticized Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for being in power for six long years, and in those six years not seriously tackling the economic issues. Moshe Kachlon and Benjamin Netanyahu completely agree on how to tackle the issue. It was a question of do you trust Netanyahu, mm -hmm. who hasn't done so in the last six years as an incumbent, to do so in his next government. So it was not a campaign on the issues, where the parties largely agree on what needs to be done. <clears throat> of course, Netanyahu had a dramatic about face on the question of a Palestinian state in the final days of this campaign because he was appealing to the party to his right um, but I think that a lot of voters uh, of Likud, we know from polls, um, do in principle want separation from the Palestinians, mm -hmm. um, but don't think it's possible anytime soon safely. Mm -hmm. So they feel that his rejection of a Palestinian state is safe for now. Their rejection is not in principle that they're opposed to Palestinian independence. So it's all about trust. Do you trust the left? on the economy and on the Palestinians and on Iran and on security, and do you trust the right? Netanyahu's victory is a victory on that question. The Israeli electorate, despite the fact that there was a much higher turnout for the left than there's been in 15 years, the Israeli electorate nevertheless rallied for the right. It trusts the right. <laughs> and when President Obama thinks that the problem with the peace talks with the Palestinians that he might want to now, uh, uh, you know, re reignite um, is Netanyahu, then he should really read carefully the results of this election because he will, he will realize, he will discover that, in fact, it is that the vast majority of the Israeli electorate is just deeply skeptical and distrustful. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's really, I think, what okay. the election is about. The only thing that still surprises me, Khaviv, is that everybody has said to me <clears throat> that the candidates in general agree there's no peace in the offing right now, and that it wasn't the Palestinian issue and it wasn't the Iranian nuclear issue that was driving the electorate, the common man and woman on the streets of Israel, to vote one way or another, that it had to do with domestic issues, that Netanyahu has not been seen to be effective in addressing all of these problems. And then we were told, you know, Israelis are upset, he, that they blame Netanyahu for the relationship between Obama, the, 
the White House in Jerusalem, and that also, even as Americans, every now and then, they just want change that Israelis felt it was time for a change. And so the polls that we saw leading up to the election all had Netanyahu trailing Herzog, and the only question was, after the election, would he still be able to put a coalition together? Lo and behold, he ends up with something like 30 seats. He seems to really have, you know, won a decisive victory. He, you know, he's on top of the political world again in the state of Israel. And American Jews and American, American reportage, whether you're watching MSNBC or Fox or NBC or CNN, they're all, Bowie, they're all just bashing Netanyahu, except for Fox. They're just bashing him. I want you to respond to, again, what we keep seeing here in America. Well, my sense of it is we, we don't have the academic research that's going to take you know, a long time and tell us, you know, in detail exactly what happened uh, at different points and interview, you know, lots and lots of Israeli voters. But lacking that research, my sense of what happened is that those polls were largely right. What those polls uh, didn't tell us was the percentage of the electorate, which is quite high, that was undecided. So other than failing to tell us how much was undecided, those polls were largely correct. And that the rally for Likud, the rally that rose, that raised turnout across the board. By the way, turnout rose for the left as well as for the right. Yes. In an important sense, everybody had a very good election. It's just the right had an even better election. Um, that all happened in the last three days, and really probably in the last few hours of Election Day itself, when large numbers of Israelis who don't trust the left accepted Netanyahu's threat warnings, just in very uh, dire warnings throughout Election Day, um, that he was losing. They believed him. They were uh, terrified of a left-wing, of a left-led government, and they went out to vote Likud. We know that there were people who voted Likud who haven't voted in the last three elections, just who haven't voted in recent years. And they came out to vote Likud this time. And these are generally people who are sick of Netanyahu. You know, he's been in power six years. Uh, they don't like the way the economy is going. But they don't trust the left even more. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that, mm -hmm. uh, look, a journalist, my colleagues, myself, we have a tendency to ask ourselves, what is the one simple thing that is going through the head of the voter? I, just, I think the voter is a little more three-dimensional than that. I yes. think voters care about the economy deeply, care about their, the safety of themselves and their families deeply. We had a war in the summer. We had a multiple terror attacks in Jerusalem in the last few months. Um, Israelis, you know, many, most Israeli families at some point have kids in the military. So it's not as though security is in some sense, you know, distant or theoretical or, you know, American support or don't support the Iraq war. But Americans are not, not all that many Americans are actually directly affected by the Iraq war, by percentage, of course. So, um, so that's not the case here. So I think the Israeli voter is deeply concerned with security, deeply concerned with the economy. And it's all a question of whether they'll vote economy if they think security is taken care of. There are people on the American scene who are saying this election indicates Israel has moved to the right. Are they correct? In a broad sense, in, over the last 16 years, no question. <laughs> More Israelis than ever want to separate from the Palestinians, and, and more Israelis than ever are scared to pull out of territory. So if you want to call the first part left-wing, I don't know if it is, but let's say the left is that sort of left-wing desire has grown. At the same time, the sense that any withdrawal is guaranteed to end with war and danger and the West Bank turning violent and aggressive has also grown to become a really very large majority of Israeli public opinion. So Israelis have certainly, on the Palestinian question, moved to the right in practical terms. In principle, in what they're willing to accept in principle, you could make a very good argument that Israelis have simultaneously moved quite significantly to the left. Mm -hmm. Again, these are labels. The Israeli voter, what I, I hope that the opinion that I'm trying to describe makes is coherent and makes sense. The labels don't entirely fit the Israeli voter. But yes, on the Palestinian question, Israelis are deeply skeptical, believe that war is guaranteed if Israel pulls out of the West Bank, 
And that's the major obstacle if anyone wants to change Israeli policy on that question. Okay. The reason I frame it that way is that other people have pointed out that although Likud did gain, they gained 12 seats over their last 18 seats they had in the last government, they basically took seats away from other right-wing parties. So, you know, Yisrael Beitena loses, and Jewish Home loses, and that it's not that there are more people who are on the right. The distribution changed, and it changed for Likud's benefit and to the benefit of Netanyahu, but that it's unfair to say that this election shows a right-wing move on the part of the Israeli electorate, because when you look at the total number that was they voted for the right last time, it's virtually the same this time. It's just concentrated on Likud. This is an illusion. Look, um, Moshe Kachlon took seats from Likud. There's no question about that. And he took quite a few seats from Yair Lapid's Yeshatid party. Now, Yair Lapid's Yeshatid party is classified by foreign pundits who watch Israel uh, as the left. And certainly yes. it's now going, apparently, probably into the opposition with the local party. Yair Lapid was also the guy in the last government who agitated constantly uh, to make sure to keep the peace talks alive and to, to, to be serious with the peace talks, etc. The voters who voted for Yair Lapid and have now switched to Moshe Kachlan, who is very comfortably go going into a government with Netanyahu and is not worried about or thinking about or in any sense campaigned on the Palestinian question, those voters simply don't think the Palestinian question is relevant. Mm -hmm. They don't think the Palestinians can reciprocate, except, you know, everything we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to suggest that those voters, when they moved from Lapid on domestic issues, they were voting for on domestic issues in the first place, to Kachlan on domestic issues, but mm -hmm. they somehow switched rightward, mm -hmm. because Kachlan is going to sit quietly, relatively quietly in the Netanyahu government, whereas Lapid personally, the man who was quite an agitator in the Netanyahu government, that is not an electorate moving rightward. It's the exact same electorate in the exact same place. Yes, very well said. I have one last question for you. One more thing we've seen a lot of. This, by the way, comes, I see it all the time now on Fox News, that the president of the United States, Barack Obama, interfered with the Israeli election and did everything he could to upset Benjamin Netanyahu and create a win for Isaac Herzog. In Israel, was there any sense that the Obama administration was involved in your political process? The Likud party campaign declared that explicitly um, multiple times. It was part of the Likud campaign. Uh, is it, only, you know, it, it wasn't official campaign literature that spoke about the White House or President Obama, uh, but official campaign literature spoke about foreign governments funding initiatives such as V15 and other organizations, which is not true. V15 is funded by uh, well-meaning American Jews almost entirely, but nevertheless, uh, that there are these left-wing um, organizations and groups that are trying uh, to change Israeli politics, to pull Israeli politics leftward. Um, that, by the way, is, is a fact. It's correct. Uh, but that was a massive part of the Likud campaign. So it, I think it did play a role. I think it played um, even a significant role, certainly in the rally of the right on the last day. That was a right that responded to Netanyahu saying explicitly multiple times on Election Day, you know, in front of the cameras, uh, that, that foreign money was meddling in this election to try and bring him down. And right when you're rallied to, his, uh, rallied to his side, even when they don't necessarily like him too much. But, Khabib, I want you to be very clear. Are you saying that there were left-wing American groups that were working against Likud and Netanyahu, or are you saying that the White House was working against Netanyahu? There is no evidence. I don't think the White House was working against Netanyahu. I think that the White House has learned that it's not very good. It certainly has tried. In 2013, when President Obama made his first trip as president to, the, to Israel, he, gave a speech. He, he refused to speak to the Israeli Knesset, and he gave a speech to Israeli young people at a convention center. <clears throat> and in that speech, he told the Israeli young people uh, to pressure their leaders uh, to make sure they can make peace, because I otherwise remember. their leaders will be too scared to make yeah. peace. 
So there's no question that President Obama has has not been shy about talking directly to Israelis and trying to pressure Netanyahu that way. This, uh, most of the times that they've done those sorts of things over the last six years have backfired on them terribly, and I think there's no evidence that they've tried to influence this election, and I think they're too scared of tripping over their own feet to have done so. You know how much I appreciate the time you give us, and... Khabib, there is nobody who gives news analysis like you do. You are always welcome here at JBS. I will chase you all the time. I wish you could to Chatzlecha in your own work. As you're, you know, it's very difficult right now for all of you to cover this very complicated situation that continues to evolve every day. But I wish you all the best, and I thank you so much, and we'll continue to chase you. Thank you, Khabib. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real, real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. You be well. The thoughts of the outstanding journalist for the Times of Israel, Chaviv Retegur, and how wonderful it is to get an Israeli voice giving Israeli perspective from within the Israeli milieu about what the elections mean to the Israeli people. And again, it's not that Chaviv is exactly right and perfectly right about everything he says, but so often we must rely on secondary and tertiary sources in the American media, print, radio, television, and we rarely get the real story. So it's wonderful to talk to Chaviv. At the same time, one of the big issues was the extent to which the U.S.-Israeli relationship might be either helped if some new person became prime minister, or would the Obama-Netanyahu disharmony and discord continue to get worse if the prime minister is reelected? And Right now, it looks like that is true. So what's it mean for the future of U.S.-Israeli relations? For some insight, I'm very pleased to have on our phones from Washington, D.C., Elliot Abram, Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies. Elliot, it is wonderful to have you back on JBS. Thank you. Great to be with you, Mark. Elliot, we're looking at the aftermath of the Israeli elections, and one of the big issues that everybody was concerned with was was what would happen to the Washington-Jerusalem relationship if, in fact, Bibi Netanyahu won re-election, and it looks like that's now happened. From your perspective, what's this mean going forward for Obama, Netanyahu, and the U.S.-Israeli relationship? Well, we have a two-year window here, slightly under two years, when this is critical because then we'll have a new president, so uh, things will change. In this period, uh, obviously, Netanyahu and Obama are not going to become friends. I hope they can try to bury the hatchet, at least in public. I hope that there will be no more remarks by unnamed White House staffers about Netanyahu. Maybe there will be a new Israeli foreign minister. From this point of view, that would help. It would give mm -hmm. you a top-level interlocutor for the White House and the State other than Netanyahu. Um, but I think this is really, uh, you know, kind of a manage this issue, cope with it. We're not going to solve it completely. What do you think, Elliot, really drives the, I don't know, discord, the disharmony? The, what is it about Netanyahu that makes Obama so upset with him? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, well, a couple of things. First, Look, Obama is a guy on the left, and Netanyahu is on the right. There's usually more tension when you have that combination, or the reverse one, you know, when you have an Israeli prime minister on the left, Republican president. Um, so first of all, it's political ideology. Uh, secondly, pure personal chemistry. Sometimes people get along, sometimes they don't. Uh, and obviously these two guys never have, not from the very beginning. Thirdly, um, the goal of Obama foreign policy in his second term now is a deal with Iran. I think mm -hmm. that's the historic accomplishment, changing that relationship between the U.S. and Iran that is foremost in the president's mind. This is the goal of his foreign policy now. Um, what stands in the way of achieving that? Who is the foremost critic of this nuclear agreement that's supposed to start the rapprochement between the U.S. and Iran? Benjamin Netanyahu, who even comes to Congress to say, don't do it. It's a bad deal. The truth is the French are very worried about this deal. All the Arab states are very worried about this deal. 
but they're saying it in private. The one who's out there fighting it is Netanyahu. And obviously that makes the president uh, pretty angry at him. Yes. Did the prime minister make a mistake, Elliot, from your perspective, by coming to a, address a joint session of Congress? No, I don't think so. I mean, it obviously annoyed the president, but he was invited, and it may have played a part in his being reelected. Um, you know, a week before the election, it looked very close. It looked as if he might well lose. Yes. I think one of the things that put him over the top was this sense he's fighting for Israel. Mm -hmm. Every Israeli agrees that this Iranian nuclear weapons program is a critical mm -hmm. issue. Who is standing up for Israel? Who is speaking out for Israel? Who's got the guts to go to Washington? It's Netanyahu. And you know, Mark, by the way, one of the interesting things here, for decades we have all said uh, an Israeli prime minister who can't manage the relationship with Washington is going to lose. In this case, the hostility between Netanyahu and Obama doesn't seem to have hurt Netanyahu at yes, all. I yes. think because so many Israelis have concluded the president's not a real friend of Israel. So the fact that Netanyahu was uh, sort of fighting back looks like it helped him in the election. Very interesting. Elliot, you've been inside the intimate halls of government. You've been in the Oval Office. You have, been, you, you have sat when Israeli prime ministers and American presidents have been face to face. How do you rank the discord between Obama and Netanyahu as you look at your own historical sweep of the relationships that have existed between various presidents and various prime ministers? How, how do you compare this one to ones you either know about personally or ones you've known because of your, as, as a student of history? I think this is the worst personal relationship ever. One can go back to big policy disagreements, like Eisenhower and uh, Suez. Yes. Um, one can, you know, there's George Bush and Yitzhak Shamir, the first George Bush. But those were, they didn't know each other very well. It wasn't really a personal issue. It was a political issue. It was a policy issue. They disagreed. And, and disagreements are, are common. I, I remember... Uh, Sharon and Olmert uh, having uh, harsh words with George W. Bush at times. But that was built on top of a good personal relationship. I think this is the first one where they have seen each other a lot, they know each other pretty well, and they really, really don't like each other. Interesting. Very interesting. You know, Jeffrey Goldberg wrote a piece just before the elections. Actually, it was just as the Prime Minister was coming to address Congress, in which he basically said that Netanyahu has totally destroyed the Israeli-U.S. relationship. He, he, he went beyond the Obama-Netanyahu relationship. He wrote a piece that basically said that Netanyahu had done untold damage to the American-Israeli relationship. I'm asking you two things, Elliot. First of all, to what extent do you believe that analysis is sound? To what extent do you believe that Goldberg was overstating it? And in general, how do you view the congressional relationship to Israel? So I'm asking two questions. First, the Goldberg piece, and then how do you see it in terms of Congress? First, I think um, Jeff Goldberg was wrong. Uh, polls revealed that the general level of support for Israel in the United States is, remains extremely high, and it has not declined. Netanyahu years. Um, and the relationship is not destroyed. It will be there when Netanyahu is no longer in office and two years from now when Obama is no longer in office. So I think it's frankly a gross overstatement, really quite silly to say that this relationship, which is so dense, mm -hmm. it's a military relationship. It's mm -hmm. an intelligence relationship, an economic, a financial, a people-to-people, -people, a religious relationship. To say that you know Netanyahu argues with Obama so it's all destroyed, me as silly. Now, I do think there's a problem here that is, in a, in a way, a natural result of the fact that you will have, when Netanyahu finished with this term, 20 years of right-wing or right-of-center government in Israel, uh, under Sharon, and then Olmert, and then uh, Netanyahu. Um, it, you go back to Sharon's election, uh, beginning of 2001. 
So it's not surprising that people uh, left of center in the U.S., including many Democrats, you know, feel like they're a little bit distant from this, these governments of Israel. I do worry about some of the support in Congress on the Democratic side, and I worry about Israel becoming a partisan issue. But I think the Democrats can address that, frankly, once Obama is gone. Um, if Clinton is the nominee, for example, because certainly under Bill Clinton, there's a terrific relationship between the U.S. and Israel. Uh, so I think this question, particularly in the House, um, is, it, is a difficult one. You remember Nancy Pelosi's uh, comments about how she had tears in her eyes over yes. Netanyahu's terrible yes. speech to Congress. This is an issue... I hope as we approach our election that cool heads in the Democratic Party uh, in the House, in the Senate, uh, presumably the Clinton campaign, realize that it's bad for both countries to allow this to go beyond being an Obama problem and become an American problem or a Democratic Party problem. It's not in their interest to do that. So I'm pretty optimistic about the long run here. Well, good. Uh, that's hard. If, it's, if you're optimistic, it's heartening. By the way, you, you know, Elliot, this was the expression of the democratic will of the Israeli people. They could have vote, voted for Herzog, they could have voted for Netanyahu, so it turns out that once again the Israeli electorate wants Benjamin Netanyahu to form the coalition government. I would like to believe that the American administration and our American Congress respects the democratic process in Israel and says if this is what the Israeli people have chosen, we, both the administration and the Congress, will embrace the new coalition government. I want to know from you whether you think I am being too Pollyanna. Is that not the way the world works? What's a more realistic view? Yeah, you're being uh, perhaps <laughs> a little bit too optimistic. I mean, there are going to be real disagreements. Um, there may be disagreements on peace negotiations with the Palestinians. Obviously, there are disagreements with the Obama administration on Iran. Um, there may be some other problems that people haven't talked about enough yet. If there's a strong Haredi presence in the new coalition, what does it mean for the position of non-Orthodox rabbis in Israel, um, divisive maybe in the diaspora here? What does it mean for that new bill that uh, says that young Haredi men have to be eligible to be drafted, conscripted in the IDF? be divisive within Israel. I think there are potential problems around the corner here. I just hope that disagreements over policy, which are normal, are not poisoned by this really pretty bad relationship at the top. Yes. The example I've given was when George W. Bush, when I was working in the White House, couldn't get along with the French president, Chirac. Yes. They really disliked each other. We worked around it. The French National Security Advisor came to Washington we and the French ambassador sat with him in the White House, Secretary of State Rice, National Security Advisor Hadley, uh, others of us. I joined in those meetings. We worked everything out. And then we just went to each of our presidents and said, look, we think we've solved this. I'd like to see something like that happen, even if the two guys at the top can't get along. That would be wonderful. All right, I can't have you on without asking you also, what is your sense of where the American administration is going with this Iranian deal? And what we see, you know, we, we hear what Benjamin Netanyahu has in criticism of the deal. And then every now and then, Elia, I hear somebody say to me, but Netanyahu doesn't really know what the deal is. Nobody knows what the deal is. Kerry is right now trying to negotiate the deal, and therefore we don't know if there's going to be a sunset clause. We don't know how many centrifuges will be spinning. We don't know what kind of nuclear material they'll be, Iran will be left with. From your perspective, how concerned are you that the administration is poised to make a bad deal that would in some way open the door for Iran to develop nuclear weapons capability? Very concerned. I think the administration seems to desperately want a deal. Um, I think that if you look back over the negotiations over the, these six years uh, of Obama, we keep making concession after concession. And by the way, that's the view of the Arab states. That's the view of the Israelis. To some extent, it's been the view of, of the French. Concession after concession. It's not fair to say we don't know what the 
you live. Yes, we don't know some of the details. But we know enough to know that we're in danger of having a pretty bad deal on a number of aspects. For example, this 10-year sunset clause. Uh, once upon a time, the United States position was no enrichment, no yes. centrifuges. We've abandoned that. So I, I think we know enough to know that um, this could be quite a bad deal. And frankly, uh, there doesn't seem to be any point at which the administration is saying no more compromises, no more concessions. Uh, if we're going to be rescued from a bad deal, it looks like it's going to have to be by the Supreme Leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei, because he just doesn't want, perhaps, any deal with the United States, which he views as the great Satan. But uh, I, I uh, do worry, along the lines that Netanyahu does, about a deal that is uh, going to allow Iran to creep along. They don't make giant leaps. They're too smart for that. But to creep along steadily toward having a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. Elliot, I love talking to you so much, and I appreciate the fact that you go out of your way to give me some time. There are so many other things we should talk about in the upcoming weeks, so I will continue to call you, but I thank you right now for just making time to respond to the, you know, the recent Israeli elections, to give me a word about Iran, and you're doing fabulous work, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Elliot. Thanks, Mark. Great to talk to you. You be well. You get the truth here at JBS. You want the truth? You watch JBS. You don't watch MSNBC. You don't watch CNN. You don't watch even Fox. You watch here. And we'll bring you people who are really on the scene, who really understand what's going on, and who bring you, you know the word MS? You know, M the MS, the truth. There is, there is so much nonsense being said and described and talked about especially on American television. It drives me crazy. And I've said to you very often, we Americans, Americans, and we American Jews, we know so little about what goes on in other countries, even countries we care about. American Jews, we know almost nothing about what's going on in Israel. And then, you know, American Jews have their own personal biases. And that's okay. American Jews are people. You know, there are Jews who are liberal. There are Jews who are more on the right. There are Jews who think Obama's terrific. And there are Jews who think Obama's been terrible for Israel. There's Jews who think Netanyahu is the best thing since sliced bread. And there are American Jews who think Obama's been a disaster for the Jewish people in the state of Israel. Okay. But when it comes to reporting the results of an Israeli election, it would be nice to really understand what was going on. And the best way to do it is to let Israelis speak in their own voice. And yesterday when we had Micah Halperin in studio, he said something so profound. And it's something we've alluded to in the past. Very often, American media outlets, whether they're print or television or radio, they report the news they want to have happen. They report as if their agenda will come to pass. They will create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And there's one more thing. You know, I, I, get, I got many wonderful emails from many of you after our show that we did, our election coverage yesterday and Really, it was a kick, and to have Micah Halperin and Shachar Azani on set with me, that was terrific, and to hear Malcolm Honline, and then to hear Izzy Liebler from Jerusalem, and then to have Mort Klein and Eric Yaffe all chiming in. Just what a, a, a wonderful couple of hours as we saw the election results. And again, I don't think we ever went too far in what we were, were saying was happening, but... Uh, I got a couple, one email from a gentleman who said, Rabbi Golub, you seemed disappointed that Netanyahu won. I was flabbergasted. I, I thought back to the entire program. I, I don't think I ever was expressed disappointment. I certainly never used the word disappointment. I didn't show disappointment. 
The reality is, by the way, I'm a huge Netanyahu fan. Uh, you know, I think he represents the state of Israel to the world scene when he comes to APAC or when he goes on American television or when he stands in the Congress of the United States, which he's done now three times. I, I just think he's marvelous. And, you know, I barely know the man. I had a chance to talk to him more personally when he was the ambassador to the United Nations a million gazillion years ago when I was much, much younger. But yeah, I don't talk to the prime minister now. But, you know, do I appreciate him? Absolutely. At the same time, I'm not an Israeli. It's not my vote. It's not my election. And if the Israeli people wake up one morning and go to the polls and vote in Isaac Bougie Herzog, it's not for an American Jew, Mark Golubon, JBS, to be critical of the Israeli people. It's not Obama's place to be critical. And look, Obama has a right to like or not like any given Israeli. But ultimately, the Prime Minister of Israel represents the state of Israel, the sovereign state of Israel. And I would like the United States to have as cordial a relationship as possible. And I feel, you know, in many ways, for all the good Obama may have done in other areas, I feel there's been a real disconnect between him and the realities of the Middle East. And he's not alone. You know, I feel many in our government just, they don't understand who, what the Middle East is. They don't understand what the Arab mentality is. They don't understand what the Islamic jihadist threat is. But ultimately, my position here on JBS is whomever the Israeli people want to be their prime minister, well, good for them, and we as American Jews have to embrace him. And we can disagree with the policy here or there. And, you know, Eric Yaffe comes on, and he's very critical of the way Obama has mishandled from Eric's position peace with the Palestinians and the West Bank, and many American Jews come on. You know, we've had Peter Beinart. Peter Beinart just kills Netanyahu. And then we've had many people come on here who, who love him. You know, Mort Klein loves Netanyahu, and and many centrists here in the Jewish community really think he's done a marvelous job. But it's, it's not our place to say there ought to be one individual who's the Prime Minister of Israel. So, you know, I was really taken aback. I'm, I'm in no way disappointed that Netanyahu has been chosen by the Israeli people, not by me, you know, not by Mark Langfan, not by Americans for a Safe Israel, not by AIPAC, not by the ZOA, not by the FIDF. No. The Israeli people went to the polls and they elected Benjamin Netanyahu as their next prime minister. They basically, as you, know, you heard Khaviv say, there was a trust placed into the Likud party and 30, 30 members of the Likud party are now going to sit in the Israeli government. And Netanyahu, and as Khabib said, it was clear yesterday, Netanyahu was going to be the one to form the next coalition government if there was virtually a tie between the two. But you read the way this election was discussed in the American media, or worse, the way it was shown on television, including, by the way, I love Sean Hannity's passion for Israel. But Sean Hannity just went out of his way to say over and over again that President Obama, whom Hannity detests, President Obama meddled in the Israeli election. And you heard Khaviv Retegur just say, were there American Jews who tried to influence the election? Yes. In both directions. There is an Adelson on the American scene who gives a lot of money, who's a close, close friend to Netanyahu. In my view, he has every right to do so. And there are Jews on the left who believe Netanyahu should be removed, and they were all for Isaac Herzog. Do they have a right? Yes, they do. And like Khaviv said, so much foreign money, so much American money given by Jews who care about Israel, who love Israel, who think their approach is the right approach for Israel, they pump money into the system. 
And that's part of we are one, by the way, you know. We don't get to vote, but the pocketbook still works. And so does the soapbox. And so there are American Jews who lobby, and they have every right to lobby. They should just do so with a degree of humility. And the humility ends at the line of the vote. So the reality is, I, you know, I would have been happy with anybody that the Israeli people chose to be prime minister. I happen to be a fan of Bibi Netanyahu, and I don't know what he, I, by the way, he may have been a disaster for the economy. I don't know. There are many people, many Israelis I speak with who I trust, who I like, I admire. They are very critical of what, Obama, of what um, Netanyahu has not done within the Israeli scene, on the Israeli uh, domestically, much more domestically than Iran. Very few people criticize him on Iran. And there are American Jews who just are, you know, have a very different view of the two-state solution and believe that he has not done enough to ease tensions between Israel and the Palestinians. And then again, there are American Jews who think he's done the exact right thing. But for me, I know him as an international spokesperson for the state of Israel. I know him through his appearances on Face the Nation and Meet the Press and a joint session of Congress and, uh, you know, or, you know, or at APAC or at the GA. And, you know, I believe that he has a stature to him, a gravitas to him, a command of the English language and an understanding of who Americans are and American Jews are that is very, very powerful and very, very helpful for the state of Israel. So personally, I'm very pleased that it looks like he's going to have another, I don't know how long, by the way. You know, each, each government is elected for four years, but it never lasts four years. It's a year and a half here, it's a year and a half there. But however long it is, okay. Benjamin Netanyahu will once again be the Prime Minister of Israel. Fine, good, I'm happy. But I am not, I wouldn't have been sad if another Israeli politician had won the day. And I would hope that every one of you who watches JBS, Jew or not Jew, that's your attitude. Your attitude is, we will celebrate Israeli democracy. I want the President of the United States to celebrate the only democracy anywhere in the Middle East, the only real operational democracy, the only place there's freedom of the press and freedom of religion and where women are free and gays are free and journalists are free, the only place in a sea of ugliness and chaos and hate and war. There's this little oasis. It's just an oasis. Teeny tiny oasis. People say the size of New Jersey. It's a little teeny tiny. It's smaller than New Jersey, you know, in reality. It's a little speck. When you see a large map, you can't even find the state of Israel. In this sea, of war and hate and bigotry and racism and everything which is an anathema to the American and to the Jewish mentality. There's this little teeny country called Israel, a functioning democracy with a parliament, not an American system of two, two party, and a parliament. And out of the parliament they choose a leader, a prime minister. And what I want, we as American Jews, and we as Americans, and what I want the American administration, and I want, want the Congress of the United States to respect the democratic process. In this instance, they chose Netanyahu. Fine, He's our, he is our people's prime minister for the next period of years. And if they had chosen someone else, I'm sorry. I would not have mourned. I would not have been critical. I would not have been disappointed or happy. I would have only been happy for 
the Israeli people. And that's one more thing. Israel is not an idea. Israel is a country of human beings. It's our family. It's men and women and children who are trying to live a life of peace, a productive life, where they educate their children and they go to work and their children grow up and are able to serve in the IDF and then go out and travel a little bit and then come home and get a wonderful education and marry. And then they want to have an apartment and children and they want a life better for their children themselves. They hope one day their children will not go to the IDF, will not have to serve, because there won't be a war. Not of Israel's making, never of Israel's making. If there's one thing every American should understand, not one war Israel has fought, not one battle Israel has fought, is of Israel's making. Israel has no choice. The Jewish tradition demands, by the way, most Jews don't know this, the Jewish de tradition demands that one protect one's life and one's family and that self-defense and pikuach nefesh, which is a term that basically means to save life, to save the other person's life and also to save one's own life. The Jew has a responsibility to protect one's own life. The American has that responsibility. Every person with a sense of self-dignity has a responsibility to protect their life, the life of their family, the life of their people, from assault. And unfortunately, Israel has been under assault. The Jewish people have been under assault in the land of Israel from the 1920s. And from the day the state of Israel was declared, the Arab world, not the Palestinian world, the Arab world, the Muslim Arab world has said, I'm sorry you Jews don't belong here. And if we have to, we'll kill you to get rid of you. Go back to where you came from. This is where we came from. No, no, no. Go back to the place that was telling you to go back home. You know, the irony is... The Jews of Europe, they would go into the men's room and the ladies' room and there would be scrolled on the wall, Jews go home. The men go home to Eretz Yisrael, what became known as Palestine. The Jews went back and the Arabs said, no, go home to Poland. Poland? Go home to Germany. Germany? Go home to Kiev. Kiev? Do you have any sense of world history? We should go back to Kiev, to Babi Yar, to Dachau, to Auschwitz. Go home? What are you? We're home. Anytime the Jew is fought, it's not of the Jew's making. This little tiny oasis of sanity, an oasis of sanity of democracy, of an orientation towards peace, to an understanding of what it means to compromise, all in this little, little, little teeny tiny country called Israel. So we as Americans and American Jews, Americans and American Jews, we have to respect the glorious democratic tradition of the state of Israel. And our administration has to respect the glorious tradition of democracy of the state of Israel. Anyway, those are some of my thoughts. As always, I encourage you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have. It is wonderful to read what you write to me. So please, email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me, and I want to be able to read some of your comments on the air. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.